Good morning. Um, you know, I was just thinking, um, people that stand up here in this pulpit before you are teachers, some are preachers, and some are storytellers. I had somebody tell me years ago after I stood up here and taught that I wasn't a teacher, but I was a storyteller. And I've, I found that using stories is, is pretty effective sometimes. It was very effective in days of old when men would travel from village to village, from tribe to tribe, from town to town sharing the news. And can you imagine the excitement when somebody would arrive in your tribe and say, boy, you got to hear this letter from Paul. And he told stories. And so I'm a bit of a storyteller, um, but I have a confession to make. Um, back in March, uh, we were having a lot of snow, and up where we live, it's really snowy. And I had to go to an elders meeting one morning, Saturday morning, and as I come out the door, my neighbor Val was out there plowing snow away from the front of the garage so I could get out, and I didn't think there was any problems because I have a four-wheel drive. So I jumped in the truck, came on down here, had our elders meeting, and I started home. And as I came around the corner to go up the tie road there, for those of you that know where I live, it gets a little steep and icy, and I reached down and put it in four-wheel drive. Didn't make much difference. I thought, wow, that's it. I get on up the road and I get to my drive, and now it's really icy and snowy, and I put it in low, nothing. So I jump out, tried to throw the locking hubs, didn't work. Well, here come Val, and he drugged me on up the hill. I went, went in and called my mechanic, and he said, well, bring it over here tomorrow. So, <clears throat> so I took it over there the next day, and he called me that night and says, I'm all done. I said, okay. So I went over and picked it up. So I'm driving up the road. I just reached down and put her in four-wheel drive high and just boom. <laughs> Went on up the road, and I thought, let's try low. Put it in low, and nothing. Wow. So I gave him a call. He said, well, bring it back. I said, it'll be over tomorrow. So the next day, I went out there, and I uh, jumped in my truck in the garage and fired it up. And uh, while it was warming up, I reached over and pulled out the manual. <laughs> See where I'm going with this? <laughs> And, uh, of course, I went right to the index and found four-wheel drive. I didn't read the rest of the manual. Went right where I needed to go. Found four-wheel drive, and I went there and says, four high, you're driving down the road 55 miles an hour, just put her in four high. Well, to me, that's transfer case suicide at that speed, but I have done it up to about 40. And then I turned the page, and it said, if you want to put it in four low, put it in neutral, reach over and throw it in. So I ran over to the mechanic and he come running out with his buddy and I said, no, wait a minute, I got a confession to make. I didn't read the manual, you know? And we're kind of the same way, aren't we? When, when we purchase something new, we want to put it to work, whether it's a car, or TV, computer. We just get that baby and we fire up, you know? And you get to using it a little bit, and you have a problem, and you don't read the manual. You go to the index and say, well, I'm having trouble with this or that. And so we don't often get the whole benefit of the manual, do we? I think we have that same problem with God's manual, don't we? I don't know about you, but when I start having a problem or somebody gives me a call... The first thing to do is to go to the back of the book. And say, yeah, there's, it's in there. You know, we, we got a quick reference. Anger, pornography, alcoholism, marriage issues. We go find it, right? But we don't read the whole manual. And we're really, really missing something if we don't. Consider Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in 
the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in season, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Now, who wouldn't want something like that? Why don't we read God's word? You know, about 400 years before that, God spoke to, I almost said a young man, an old man by the name of Joshua. 80, 85 years old then, Moses had died. He said, Joshua, you're in charge. You're going to go in and take that land that I gave to you. But before you do, you have to be strong and of good courage. You have to be strong and of good courage. Two times. And then he says, The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it. Day and night that you may observe to do all that is written in it. For then, should have said, for only then. For then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. Why wouldn't we want that? Why wouldn't we want that? Meditate. What, do you, what does he mean by meditate? It's kind of a strange word. We throw it, a word, we throw it around. Um, the concordance tells us it's a devise. It's to muse. It's to chew on. It's to imagine. It's to be in. But what does it mean to be in it day and night? Not just to read it and think, man, that's pretty cool. Well, what does it mean to be in it? You know, we all got families and jobs and stuff. And we always push the Bible aside because these other things take precedence. But what happens when you begin to get into his word and you begin to study it and you begin to reap the benefits from it? We have to be in it. A friend of mine was on his way to town one day Got up that morning in kind of a funk. Didn't really want to go to work. Didn't really want to do anything. Didn't want to have his quiet time. But he purposed in his heart when he got in his truck to head to town that he was going to praise God for everything he saw. For every blessing he saw that day. It tells us we're supposed to praise him. We're supposed to thank him in all things. And he began to thank God for that beautiful forest and that green hillside and those sheep and those cattle and those grapes now. And before it was over, by the time he got to town, to his job, he was on top of the world because he had meditated on God's blessings. God tells us to do that. 1 Thessalonians tells us in 5, 16 through 18, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. We do that. Maybe you don't like to read. Maybe you never caught the, caught the bug. Maybe it just doesn't grab you. I visit some churches down south and I look around and I never see a Bible might see a phone, but I don't see a Bible. When somebody tells me they don't like to read, I just say, well, you haven't found something really interests you yet. There's everything right here that will grab your interest. Everything. Maybe you have a little trouble understanding it. I do at times. That's why we have teachers. That's why we have concordances. That's why we have dictionaries. That's why we have Bible studies and sharing and men praying with one another. That's how you learn what God's trying to tell you. Ask the Holy Spirit to direct you and teach you next time you open this Bible. All you have to do is ask. And he says he'll do it. James 1 through 5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without approach, and it will be given to him but ask in faith. The late Chuck Messler used to say something about this book. 66 books by 40 different authors, and now we find that it was an integrated message from a different time domain. God is not in our time. He is timeless. He created it. 
God's word penned on three different continents, three different languages. Over a period of 1,500 years, all 66 books have a marvelous message of unity that I hope someday you will discover. I was not a reader as a young lad. I could, wasn't interested. So I went hunting with my dad one time and he would say, watch out for that jump cactus. Watch out for that choya. Began to explain these things to me. Let's go down by the cottonwood tree down there and see if there's any tracks there's normally watered. I said, Dad, how'd you learn all this stuff? He said, I read. Really? Really? Yeah. So he got home that night and he gave me a Louis L'Amour book. Read every one of them. Huh? It was interesting because he was writing and talking about places that I was hunting and moving around. But it was interesting and it grabbed me. Began to read pretty much everything. I have two or three Bibles around the house. A couple of Kindles. You know, we've all got those sitting on the back of the toilet. Maybe you got one on the coffee table. <clears throat> but read it, we must. I can guarantee you that every person that stands up here in this pulpit to teach you has spent 10, 12, 15 hours in Scripture. Or if you're me, maybe 8, 10, 12 months. <laughs> but after sitting here and hearing the Word of God taught, we should be like Bereans. Paul said the Bereans sit here and listen to the Word, and then they go home and read it and prove it. They don't just take somebody's word for it. And I'm sure there are times when you sit out here and say, you know, I don't see that in here. Am I missing something? Then you ask, but you go home and you study it. Lord, what are you trying to tell me here? And, and I will tell you that you and I can read the same scripture and the Lord speaks to us differently. Based upon my need, based upon your need, he speaks to us differently. Not wrong, just what we need. But we have to read it. I had a little Bible given to me in 1952 after I suffered a life-threatening injury. Still have it. Pretty beat up. Most interesting story in 1952 was Samson slaying the Philistines with a jawbone of an ass. I was a young child. It was pretty interesting. Got me interested, though. I have a little Bible like we hand out in the jails, in the prisons, that was given to me by the U.S. Army. I don't even know if they do that anymore. But they gave every inductee a Bible, and you can bet your sweet bippy I read it during Vietnam time. My Bible that I use today, my brother gave me. My, actually, my daughter gave me. My brother gave me the cover. I got a big red one at home. Got a bunch of extra books in it called the Apocrypha. It's a Catholic Bible, you know, the kind you set on your coffee table and you move it so you can dust it right now. Yeah. <laughs> but we don't read them, do we? But what makes this word so impactful when you do is the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you, the Holy Spirit will minister to each and every one of your hearts. But you just have to read it. Maybe you have an audio Bible. Fine. I think Floyd Bodfield. Dear friend Floyd, I love that old boy. The old coot. Um... But I gave him a bunch of stuff, and he said, you know, Ron, I, I don't read very well. He said, even when I was in school, if it came to reading, I was dead. If the teacher taught something in the classroom, I, it was a breeze, but don't give me anything to read. So I brought him some audio Bibles. Then the player wouldn't work. God was, doing, God was doing everything to get the word of that man, and he was getting fought tooth and nail. But Floyd's in heaven right now. Praise the Lord. 
Why is it the most popular book in the world? Because it's God's Word. It tells about our Creator and what He's done for you and me. Even if you're not a believer and just searching for something to read, it has everything in there you could possibly want. It has laws, politics, intrigue, war, peace, dietary restriction, hygiene, romance, love, hate, deceit, and salvation. It's got it all. Just have to read it. It has the law, the history of the Jewish people. It contains poetry, prophecy. It tells the story of our Savior in the Gospels, eyewitness accounts of his life, death, and resurrection. The history of the burgeoning church in its infancy in the book of Acts, Paul's letters to various churches that establishes the doctrine we mostly use today. Then you have James, realistic, pragmatic James. This is the way it's got to be. This is how you should live. John and Peter talks about their reverence for the Lord. Jude tells us how to be aware of certain men who have crept in to cause destruction. I'm not going to say anything about that. You know, just like today. That's okay. <laughs> then it finishes with a prophecy that tells us how this is all going to end. And I think we're beginning to see it today. You know, a couple of years ago, Travis came in. He was all excited. At that time, Russia had blockaded the straits between lower and upper Ukraine. <coughs> Excuse me. And he was explaining this to the kids in Ezekiel 38 and 39 and Gog and Magog, and they're all excited. It's exciting times. And the next day, I came in and I got my computer and I pulled up Google Maps and I put it on the big screen and you could see the map and you could see the boats that were doing the blockade. And I said to the kids, what Travis taught yesterday is what you and I see and how exciting this is to see these things unfold. What I'm showing you today is what the world sees and they're going, oh my gosh. No, it's all part of God's plan. We should not be in distress. We should be concerned, but we shouldn't be in distress over what we're seeing today. God's got it in the palm of his hand. Never have anything to worry about. There's going to be death and destruction and disease and people will get hurt. People will die. But God's got it all in his hand. We should not be concerned. If you're into numerology, which I have no intention of trying to explain from up here, um, mainly because I cannot, but I was reading about a fellow by the name of Ivan Panin. He was an exiled Russian back in the 1800s, and he became fascinated with the numerology in the Bible. Spent 50 years studying it. But he found that a study of sequential numbers, I think every 50th, 50th letter in the book of Genesis and Exodus, spelled Torah. If you went to Numbers and Deuteronomy, every 50th letter you put them together, spelled Torah backwards. And then you go to Leviticus, and a sequence of numbers that he discovered spells Yahweh. The Torah points to God. Amazing stuff. Way above my head. It's filled with scientific facts, including the earth being round. Isaiah 40.22 says, It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants, you and me, are like grasshoppers. But think about Columbus. They didn't read the manual. I once said to my uncle, we were watching a man landing on the moon. Remember when that occurred? Some of you may, some of you may not. When the man landed on the moon, I thought, what a marvelous marvelous adventure that was. And my uncle said, yeah, but it doesn't compare to Columbus. So what are you talking about? He said, these guys knew where they were going. He didn't have a clue. <laughs> In his mind, they were going to go out there and possibly fall off the edge of the earth. So he didn't read the Bible. He didn't read the manual. 
There would have been fewer concerns if he had. Matthew Morey, a sailor and an oceanographer, he read the manual. He told his wife or his family that Psalm 8 had impacted what later became his career, and that was mapping the currents in the ocean that are still being used today, by the way. Mapping all the currents in the saline paths. He read the manual. And then in World War II, the fellows that were flying over to bomb Japan, they found out that there were currents up there that they didn't even know about. Should have read the manual. Leviticus chapter 13 and 14 speaks of medical issues and how to isolate those that are ill. Deuteronomy speaks of sanitary conditions regarding human waste, which was a problem for hundreds of thousands of years. Both books addressed hand washing. Wash your hands, especially when dealing with the sick and infectious. I couldn't find one word in there about masks. <laughs> Not one. How about dinosaurs? Job 40 says, Look now at the behemoth which I made along with you. He eats grass like an ox. See now, his strength is in his hips and the power is in his stomach muscles. He moves his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are tightly knit. His bones are like beams of bronze. His ribs like bars of iron. He is the first of the ways of God and only he who made him can bring him near his sword. Compare that to any animal we have today. Nope. Hippo doesn't even come close. Got a little tail about that long. <laughs> giants. Giants in the land. Genesis 6, 4. So there were giants in the earth in those days. Numbers, we saw giants. And we were like grasshoppers in their own sight. For only King Og of Basham remained of the giants. And his bedstead was an iron bedstead, nine cubits in length and four cubits in width, according to the standard cubit, 13 and a half by what, nine feet? That's a big man. You know, I did a wedding about two years ago for my grandson. He's six foot nine. You should see the picture, I'm right here. <laughs> you know? And his brother is about six five and six four. They're still giants in the land. And if you're an Orange County person, how about them angels, huh? That used to be the saying in Orange County, how about them angels? You know, the guys over there in the ball field, but how about these angels? I mean, we got a team nobody's going to beat. Michael the Archangel and Gabriel the Claren and many, many, many more. One angel slains 185 men in one night. That's some powerful critters. Fascinating stuff. Travis talked about something last week about people called watchers. Are they the angels? Didn't really clarify it. I don't know that we know. But there are watchers looking over you and I. And how many times have you said yourself or heard somebody say, boy, an angel was really watching over me on that one, huh? Hebrews 13.2 says, Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Who knows that they're not amongst us today. I had two friends that I used to work with. I'll just call them Dennis and Mac. And they, they and their wives rented a junkyard, cheap, Class C motorhome and headed for Oklahoma to visit family. Now, Dennis was kind of a laid back character, didn't really, nothing much bothered him. Mac was not a type A, he was a type AAA person. I mean, everything bothered this guy. And the car broke down multiple times there, multiple times on the way back. And when they got to uh, some town up there in, what was the name of it? What was it, up in Arizona? 
one of the mountain towns, and the truck had broke down, the thing had broke down, and so they pulled in, and they got her fixed up, and pulled it over to Dennis's putting fuel in, and Mac headed in to get something to eat and snack on, and boom, he went down with a massive heart attack. Now, we were trained uh, yearly in CPR. Dennis runs over, gets on him, checks his pulse, no breath, a couple of puffs. <sighs> Nothing's working. Dennis says, all of a sudden he heard this soft, quiet voice say, you're doing it wrong. And he looked back, and there was this person behind him. He couldn't see his entire face because the sun was right behind the person. But he was a big man, he had a moon face, wearing a flat-brimmed hat with a round crown like the Navajos do in that area. And he says, you're doing it wrong. Do this. Dennis turned around and did what the guy, Mac coughed and started breathing and everything else. And he looked back. And the guy was pulling out of the gas station in a little old junky red pickup. He knew it was him because he could see the hat. And he said he wasn't there when we got there, and he left before I got done. That was an angel. Dennis was not a believer, by the way. Angels are amongst us. This book has been challenged by the best and comes away victorious. I praise God daily for archaeologists. These boneheads, they go out there trying to prove something wrong and they always end up proving it right. <clears throat> Matter of fact, they just found something. They think they may have found the ark again. They found it many times over the past few years. There's been over 100 archaeological discoveries just in modern times that have proven the Bible. Back in the 70s, there was a, a fellow by the name of Dwayne Gish. He was a biochemist, and he set out to disprove the Bible. And as is often the case, became not only a believer, but an advocate for it. And he wrote a book called Evolution, True or False? Fossils say no. No transitional fossils. You don't jump from one to the other. Let's face it. He debated with over 300 evolution before he died. He said, show me one transitional fossil. Couldn't show them one. Praise God for archaeologists. <clears throat> I had an anthropology professor in college. Are you ready for this? Dr. Also Zatai Pentheo. That was his last name. Good guy. He was, a, he was a good teacher. I really enjoyed his class, but one day he pulled out some fossils. He was showing us these fossils. And somebody says, Well, how old are they? Well, they're millions, millions of years old. Well, how do you know? Well, because the rocks we found them in. How'd you know how old the rocks were? He said, well, because the fossil we found there. <laughs> Get it? We didn't either. His class blew up, by the way, when we got into the, uh, the greater apes and on down and all the different eras and when we went from greater apes to human beings, and I went, wait a minute, wait, wait, where's the deal here? Well, it's right there. I said, no, no, no. There's about 150,000 years there. We're missing something. And he said, if you think I'm going to open this class up to a debate on religion, on hope, on the belief in things yet to come, you're wrong. Somebody else said, why not? And the class went kablooey, you know. <laughs> Made for a very interesting discussion. You know, I just sat back and watched them. It was kind of fun. <laughs> There's several things that scientists struggle with today. Irreducible complexity. Travis has talked about Michael Behe from the pulpit. When we first studied it and read his little book, he had studied these flagellum and they... He had found that there were 28 different types of working little things within this cell. And you lose one, it dies. You change one, it dies. In other words, it cannot, cannot evolve. It dies. He later worked on blood clotting, which is absolutely one of my favorites. 
Think of it this way. The body moves massive amounts of this blood. For a woman, it's on the higher side, about 7,828 liters a day, and in a healthy man, about 7,000 through virtually every cell in your body. Amazing machine this God has created. And as far as the women's blood, I chalk it up to multitasking. Women are very, very capable of this. Men pull out the box. I'll use this tool, put it back, pull out the other box. <laughs> Women got things going everywhere. It's crazy. <clears throat> but doctors know the value of blood. So does God. He calls it life. In Leviticus, he says, for the life of the flesh is in its blood. It's blood favorite argument with regards to evolution change the blood a little bit and see what happens a little scratch or hemophiliac or you change it the other way and you're stiff as a rock you can't change the blood or oh, they can thin it today they can thicken it but they can't change it, the makeup of it and then the eye another good argument the eye I'm going to try and read this like Darwin wrote it, so please forgive me. Please forgive me. <laughs> to suppose that the eye, with all its, its inimitable contrivances, adjusting... <laughs> adjusting... Adjusting... The focus to different distances for admitting certain amounts of light for the co correction of spherical and chromatic aberration. <laughs> to even think that that could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd, absurd in its highest degree. To be honest, he later said, I suppose it'd be possible. That's not scientific evidence in any shape. Jesus spoke about the importance of the eye. He said the light of the body is in the eye. Have you ever held the hand of a loved one or an animal when the life passed from it and watched the light leave the eye? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and then to discover prophecies, which are by far one of the best arguments because the Bible is the only book that can tell the future and be 100% accurate. <clears throat> 400 years before Israel existed, God told Abram he'd have a kid. His wife didn't believe it. Later he prophesied they'd be enslaved by Egypt. Later they'd be enslaved by Babylon, be released by a Persian king whose name was Cyrus. They would spread throughout the known world and then he would draw them back to their own land as he addresses in an Ezekiel, 700 BC. He drew them back as we know in 1948. And in Psalms, the pain and suffering he went through for you and me. Psalm 21 says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? from the words of my groaning in verses 13 and 18 says the company of evildoers have enclosed me they've pierced my hands and my feet I count all my bones they look at me and stare they divide my garments among them they cast lots for my clothing crucifixion perfectly described 800 years before the Romans perfected it that's prophecy Isaiah says, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was on him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned each one to his own way, and on and on through the entire verse. 700 years before it happened. Exactly perfect. And another amazing fact about this book, Jesus is represented in every book in the Bible. This came from a message I heard 22, 23 years ago on a New Year's Eve. I didn't come up with this. Smart enough, but this guy is. Jesus is in every book of the Bible. 
In Genesis, Jesus Christ is the seed of woman. That's verse 315. In Exodus, he's the Passover lamb, chapter 12. In Leviticus, he's our high priest. Now, as I was going through this and applying the verses to it, I thought, you know what? Be a great time for you guys to read the manual. You can find them. They're in there, okay? In Leviticus, he's our high priest. In Numbers, he's the pillar of clouds by day and the pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he's a prophet like unto Moses. In Joshua, he's the captain of our salvation. In Judges, he is our judge and lawgiver. In Ruth, he's our kinsman redeemer, Boaz. In First and Second Samuel, he's our trusted prophet. In Kings and Chronicles, he's our reigning king. Ezra, he is the rebuilder of broken down walls of human life. In Esther, he is our Mordecai, praying for us and encouraging us. In Job, he is our ever-living redeemer. Psalms, he's our shepherd. Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, he's our wisdom. In the Song of Solomon, he's our loving bridegroom. In Isaiah, he's the Prince of Peace. Jeremiah, he's the Righteous Branch. In Lamentations, he is our Weeping Prophet. In Ezekiel, he is a Wonderful Four-Faced Man. In Daniel, he's the Fourth Man in Life's Fiery Furnace. In Hosea, he is the Faithful Husband, forever married to the backslider, you and me. In Joel, he is the Baptizer with the Holy Ghost. In Amos, he is our burden bearer, Obadiah, mighty to save. Jonah, he's our great foreign missionary. In Micah, messenger of beautiful feet. In Nahum, he is the avenger of God's elect. In Habakkuk, he is God's evangelist crying, revive thy work in the midst of years. In Zephaniah, he's our savior. In Haggai, he's the restorer of God's lost heritage. Zechariah, he is the fountain opened in the house of David for sin and uncleanness. In Malachi, he is the son of righteousness, rising with healing in his wings. In Matthew, he is the king of Jews. In Mark, he is a servant. In Luke, he is the son of man, feeling exactly what you and I feel. In Acts, he is the savior of the world. In Romans, he is the righteousness of God. In 1 Corinthians, he is the rock that followed Israel. In 2 Corinthians, he is the triumphant one giving victory. In Galatians, he's your liberty. He sets you free. In Ephesians, the head of the church. In Philippians, he's your joy. In Colossians, he is your completeness. In First and Second Thessalonians, he is your hope. First Timothy, he's your faith. Second Timothy, stability. In Philemon, he's your benefactor. In Titus, he is the truth. In Hebrews, he is your perfection. In James, he is the power behind your faith. In Peter, he is your example. In 2 Peter, he is your purity. In 1 John, he is your life. 2 John, your pattern. 3 John, he's your motivation. In Jude, he is the foundation of your faith. And in Revelation, he's your coming king, and he's coming soon. He is the first and last. He's the beginning and the end. He is the keeper of creation and the creator of all. He's the architect of the universe and the manager of all times. He always was, he always is, he always will be unmoved. Unchanged, undefeated, and never undone. He was bru bruised and brought healing, pierced and eased pain. He was persecuted and brought freedom. He was dead and brought life. He was risen and brings power. He reigns, he brings peace. The world can't understand him. The armies can't defeat him. The schools can't explain him. And the leaders cannot ignore him. Herod couldn't kill him. Pharisees couldn't confuse him. And the people couldn't hold him. Nero couldn't crush him. Hitler couldn't silence him. And the new age cannot replace him. And scientists can't explain him away. He's light, love, longevity, and Lord. He's goodness, kindness, gentleness, and God. He's holy, righteous, mighty, powerful, and pure. His ways are right. His word is eternal. His will is unchanging, and his mind is on you and me. He is our bridegroom, and we are his bride. When we sing worship songs here, I don't know about you, but I want to make sure my voice sounds really good sometimes. Um, 
but I also want to worship the Lord. So are we trying to sound good or are we trying to give praise and glory to our Lord through our worship songs? Here's one I learned years ago. I won't sing it. I don't want to empty the church just yet. I'd like to stick around and fellowship a little bit. I did sing in a church choir for Easter several years ago. I don't know how I got talked into that, but I think most of the time I pulled a Milli Vanilli. You know, it's where you move your lips and nothing comes out. We often ask if you wake with a song in your heart. You ever wake with a song in your heart? Just singing about the Lord. Here's one that I learned years and years and years ago, a simple song, and again, I won't sing it. But it just goes something like this. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. <sighs> There's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus. Like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms may all pass away, but there's something about that name. That name causes wars. That name causes grief. That name causes untold joy and salvation. It is not going away. When you give your life to the Lord and ask the Holy Spirit to help you understand, to come in and direct your life, the words begin popping off the pages if you'll let them. We heard a Catholic priest in 1975. He said a new priest had come to, the, come to the diocese and young kid and asked him if he wanted to come over for a Bible study. He thought, sure, I'll go over, smoke a few cigars, have a few drinks, play some cards. Catholic Bible study, right? He said, I went over there and we actually had a Bible study. He said, you know, I, I never read the Bible. I never read the Bible before. And as we got into this Bible study, and saw what the Lord was talking about. The, the words were literally popping off the page. I never saw that before. I never knew that. The words will pop off the page if you will allow them to. And when you read and you meditate and begin to understand what a marvel this book is and what it really is, it will come alive for you. I promise you it will. This book is all about God's love for you and me and how he, he wants to spend eternity with us. He sent his son to die for us so we might stand in his presence one day. How can we not want to know more about him? Open your Bible and read. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you again for your word. It is our life, Lord. It should be our life. We should rest in your word. And take comfort and joy. And know that you have us in the palm of your hand. And Lord, I want to thank you for this body. I had a call with a young gentleman the other day who attended here for some time. And then he had to leave and go back to a, another state. He was having some struggles. And he said he longs so to be back here where he's hearing the word of God. To where there's a people that are not judging him for how he looks, how he dresses, or even for his sin. They just loved him. Lord, thank you for that. May it never change, Lord. May you just bless our pastor as he is away, giving him a time of refreshment, a sweet time with his family. Bring him back to us, Lord, that we may sit at his feet and hear his teachings as well. And thank you again for your word. Thank you most of all for your son that died that made this all possible. We thank you in his name, Jesus Christ. Amen.